Please join us for the address given by Father Mitch Packler at the 2018 EWTN Family Celebration in Jacksonville, Florida. Thank you all very much. It's, it's really great to be back here in Jacksonville. Like this town, may, the many times I've been able to come here, I get over to St. Marin's Maronite Catholic Church on a re fairly regular basis. It's somebody from over there that I could hear him applauding in Lebanese. Shukran <laughs> Tir. And this is something that I very much think we need to consider in our evangelization today. It's changed quite a bit over the years. I see on a regular basis new problems arise and new questions arise. And we ought not be afraid of the questions people raise about the faith. That shouldn't scare us. We shouldn't be scared that we don't always know the answers. Don't make it, don't let it make you nervous that you don't know all the answers. But rather, to see the new questions as a challenge to go and learn more. That has to be our approach. And I would say that I've been doing apologetics, that is, defense of the faith, and with it, evangelization for a very long time. Back in the 1970s, the issue arose when some evangelicals began an anti-Catholic movement. I don't know if you remember the Alberto comic book series that came up in the 70s. And the successful sales of that comic book series helped to motivate people like Jimmy Swaggart to become more anti-Catholic. And there were about 150 professional anti-Catholic organizations around the country challenging us on a lot of the usual questions that came from the time of the Protestant Reformation, proving in Scripture that you have purgatory, devotion to the saints, the rosary, and so on. And a lot of that went away as Catholics arose to think these issues through. and ask questions like, where in the Bible does it say you have to find every answer in the Bible? Yeah. <laughs> or as I responded during one debate, when a man said to me, is there anything in your Catholic tradition that is not already in the Bible? I said, yes, sir. I looked across and I said, the table of contents. <laughs> because no book of the Bible tells you what books go in the Bible. And that fad has fairly much faded away. It's here and there, but the strength of that fad has faded away as Catholics arose to answer these questions. We saw the rise of cults also in the 1970s. These were a variety of different types of cult that were trying to control people's minds and either get them to give their money or get them to work for the cults in order to get them money. 
and most of those have faded away also. We saw the rise of the New Age movement starting in the 70s, but really coming into big prominence with billions of dollars a year being spent on New Age paraphernalia, books, seminars, and they've pretty much faded away. We now have seen in the late 90s and on into the present, the rise of the professional atheists. They are attacking the faith on the basis of atheism and claims to science. And they have great sway at our universities and among our students. Not because they have very good arguments, it's but rather that they use their power as professors to give bad grades and to intimidate the students with poor grades and if not even flunking unless the students reject their faith in God. And even if the kid says, well, I'll just say it on the paper, but I won't tell the professor what I truly mean, what they end up doing throughout many of our college campuses is intimidating our students to not bring up their faith not to mention that they try to live their faith, that they want to live Catholic morals and they want to practice by going to mass on Sunday and they intimidate them. And when they get our students to even, again, on a paper, deny their faith, they turn our students into cowards who won't stand up for their faith commitment. And we're still in the midst of that, along with the impact, the deadly impact of the double revolution of the late 1960s, the drug revolution and the sexual revolution that's devastating our culture and is now just being taken for granted. Some of you may have heard me say on television at times that Karl Marx wrote in his dissertation that religion is the opiate of the people. And he was against religion because it stopped them from fighting the revolution to overturn capitalism and the bourgeoisie. So he turned religion into his enemy and said it was an opiate. However, from the way we see our politicians voting in favor of legalizing drugs, I'm starting to say that now for the progressive liberals of our culture, Opiates are the opiates of our people. <laughs> and they'd like to keep them drugged so that they don't think. And they can be manipulated and kept mildly enough happy so that they'll do what the politicians want. And of course, it's the same thing with the politicians who promote sexual libertinism. This is a way to say, yeah, the church is against you. They're just trying to scare you by saying you're going to go to hell if you do these bad things. And we're telling you you don't have to. And I'm afraid. I'm afraid there are too many people inside the church who also are saying that, oh, it's not a mortal sin if you do this, that, and the other mortal sin especially in the sexual realm, or the ideology that developed in the late 60s and through the 70s. 
You can't just focus on the sixth and the ninth commandment about lust and chastity. There are other commandments and, you know, you're neglecting understanding issues of social justice if all you do is talk about sexual sins. Meanwhile, we see that inside the church and inside the clerical state, all the way up through the hierarchy, there was actually a pretty strong need to focus on the sixth and the ninth commandments. And issues of justice were broken when those commandments were broken, especially when young people, mostly adolescent boys, and when other vulnerable people were abused. So no, we need to have more of it. And the sexual revolution is a rope-a-dope situation. Keep this in mind. It is a satanic rope-a-dope situation. In the early days of the sexual revolution, the idea was this. Well, you should have freedom to make your own choices. You don't need City Hall to give you a piece of paper so that you can show love to the person you love. And you don't need the church to say that it's okay to engage in relations. And the church has no right to tell you whom you cannot love. That is to say, whom you cannot enter into sexual relations with. That's what they really mean. And then, if you do engage in those relations, they catch you and they say, see what a bad person you are. Look at this whole thing going on with the politicians around, on all sides, by the way. It's not a one-party issue. But things that various politicians and business people did years ago, now they're saying, see, you're a bad person. You were doing this, that, and the other thing. So on one hand, they tell you you should have your freedom, but when you exercise the freedom the way they expected you to, then they go after you. That's what I mean by a rope-a-dope situation. And they put it in the press and they use besmirching your name so that instead of confessing your sins to us priests, you read about it in the papers. And these are not good situations in our culture, are they? Now, one of the points I want to bring up as we do this review, look, think back on some of these things I've mentioned of the different kinds of apologetics we have to do. And through all of it, we need to have two elements working together. First, we need to have a faith in God our Lord, a faith in His salvation that comes to us through Jesus Christ, without whom no one comes to the Father. We need to have a faith that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. We need to have a faith in everything that we profess out loud when we say the creed, whether it's the Apostles' Creed at the beginning of our rosary, or the Nicene Creed at Sunday Mass, or on Easter in the Roman Rite, when we renew our baptismal vows, we need to make the statement of faith in the Creed a personal commitment 
to that truth. That is a personal act of faith so that it's not only words that we read, but each time I say, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, I'm also making a commitment to God the Father and to Jesus Christ, his Son, and to the Holy Spirit, and to the Holy Catholic Church, filled with sinners from the very beginning, to be sure. But nonetheless, a Holy Catholic Church, because Jesus Christ is the source of that holiness, and it is filled with saints in the past and in the present. But this commitment in faith, this ongoing renewal of our decision to believe, must be a stronger commitment to God because he's committed to us first. Secondly, it is also a commitment to God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, and to his church, and to the sacraments, a commitment that is going to be stronger than our own sins and stronger than the sins of people inside the church who cause us scandal. The word skandalizon in Greek means to cause someone to stumble. Skandalizo means I cause someone to stumble. And there's plenty of that. But my commitment to the faith and the truth of that faith, my own personal act of faith, needs to be stronger than the sin of causing scandal and all the other problems. And it also needs to be stronger than the sins of those people outside the church who tried to convince me on a wide variety of bases to leave it. Whether they tried to manipulate me like they're doing to our college students, or whether they tried to manipulate me through the nightly news shows and television programs, or whether they try to manipulate me through false information and fake history. I need God's grace to give me a faith that is stronger than evil. Are all of you ready to make that kind of faith commitment? Yes. This is why we're here. This is why Mother Angelica started the network. This is why we broadcast. That's our starting point. And that's our first issue. I mentioned two issues we have to keep side by side and together. The second one is that our faith also is in need of our reason, that is, our ability to think. I can, I have two pet cats. I can get them to go into church, <laughs> but it won't make them a Catholic. <laughs> and sometimes they like to go into my chapel at home not because they want to read the prayers with me, but they like to scratch their ear on the binding of my prayer book. <laughs> That's about it for them. Especially they get their nose right up on the corner of a book. They like that. And even better if they can sit on my lap and get me to scratch behind their ears. You have to also use that quality of being human that distinguishes us from the animals. The animals have many of the same emotions we do. My cats get mad at me 
if I don't get the food for them right when they want it. And if I'm not there to open up the door for them to get outside and start hunting, because they like to take care of the moles. They can be, especially the, the females, she can be very insistent. And they know what they want, they want, and then, they, but they also can be very sweet. They can be very affectionate. They show very great similarity to our emotions, and our emotions are similar to theirs. Our emotions are rooted in the fact that we have this animal body. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. We need to keep our emotions in good balance. We don't deny that we're emotional. But what distinguishes us from the animals is that we know how to reason. We know how to make logical statements. We can take an idea and go from point A to point B to point C, following through logically to its conclusions. We can see the direction in which ideas go. We can also know a lot more history than the animals can. The animals learn from their own instincts. Their instincts have them act in certain ways. They don't even know why they always do. They just go into automatic mode with their instincts. And they can also learn from events. They become better at certain kinds of activities in their lives. Certainly my cats bring back more moles than they did when they were kittens. By the way, they were born out in the woods. There were feral cats that I domesticated. So they're, they're outdoors animals for the most part. And they learn, that's, which is good. But what they cannot do is research why cats are different than dogs. They can't explain. They know that they run away if there's a dog around, but they can't tell you the difference between the canine and the feline families. They can't do any research into their own medicine. They can't do any analysis of the history of the world before cats existed. They can't hardly remember a few days ago, and they certainly don't know their own names. Dogs do, but my cats never get it. So we also have memory. But we have, in addition to personal memory, we have the ability to think and understand the past and also project into the future on many different levels. It's marvelous. We sort of take that for granted, but we shouldn't. And we live at a time that absolutely amazes me. I'm so impressed by the kinds of knowledge that are available, books that I just have never been able to have and I had no, to which I had no access. These books I can now download in their entirety in their original languages or in translations. It's absolutely amazing. And that applies to books and articles that go back to the earliest days of writing all the way through the present. And yet, here's where the problem comes in. While all that is available, we see the scores of our students going down in schools. They apparently know less. 
They don't know American history. We expect, especially if they go to a government school, we expect them to learn American history at least, and they don't. And that doesn't mean that we should jump to blaming the teachers. I'm not trying to blame the teachers. There are a lot of factors that go into it, including the breakdown of family, because the students who do best are the ones to whom their parents read and whom their parents help with the homework. And we see now that 52% of all American children are born to unmarried parents. The majority of all children are born to unmarried parents, and it seems to be still going up. So their parents don't read to them, and they don't lose. That's best one of the factors. And the textbooks that some of the school districts choose are foolish. One textbook had two paragraphs. It was a social studies book for middle school. Had two paragraphs on George Washington, but six pages on that great heroine of American life, Marilyn Monroe. I think that's disproportionate in terms of importance in American history. It'll keep the middle school boys interested. <laughs> and maybe some of the girls will want to imitate her. Hopefully not. But it's not real history. And again, the teachers don't choose all that. Plus all the government rules on how much they have to report. It makes it difficult. And the reason I want to bring that point up about how this is not going on at school is that we all have to make a firm commitment to understanding and using our minds, our thought, to use our reason, our ability to think, our ability to know about the past, our ability to project into the future, especially with science. She almost sneezed. And we have to pay attention to the ways we gain knowledge. Now, I've just brought up some of the areas of secular science, American history, and the various areas of physics in biology. I had an interesting call the other day on my radio show. A college student said, I don't know how to defend life with my college peers. And I asked him, well, what, what was the issue? I said, well, when does life begin? And in the discussion, I said, um, you know, all the answers your friends are giving you are arbitrary decisions to say two months, six months, whatever, out of the womb. I said the only scientifically objective moment that you can use is the moment of conception, because at the moment of conception, all of your DNA is present. When that one sperm fertilizes that one ovum, at that moment, the unique person that is you begins to unfold. There never was anybody with exactly the same DNA as you, because your DNA is not the same as your parents. It's now unique because it's from both of them. And nobody else will ever be like you. That's the only scientifically objective moment to which you can look and say, this is when you get started and you will not become another person. You will not be less than what you are. You don't ever lose your DNA. You don't gain DNA. This is who you are and what you're going to be. And he, he, I said, you, you knew that, didn't you? He said, no, he didn't even know that. 
I don't know what they teach them in biology, but it might be that they're afraid to teach that because even science becomes politically directed. And if you come up with scientific data that contradicts what is presently politically correct, you get shot down. Now, if you think that they are getting shot down in regard to science and American history, and that ideology sometimes blocks out important facts, how much more do you think they don't learn about the Catholic Church? Do you think they're getting a good history of the Catholic Church in the public schools? Or even in the Catholic schools sometimes? Do they learn the sacraments? Do they read the scriptures? Do they understand the meaning of the Ten Commandments? In the public schools, it has been illegal to even have a copy of the Ten Commandments in a public school. Did you know that? 1980, Supreme Court made it illegal to have a copy of the Ten Commandments. If you don't allow those words, thou shalt not kill, to be even in the building, then why do you go around blaming God when somebody comes into a school and kills people? How did God ever let this? He told you, thou shalt not kill. But you won't let that even be said, yet alone learn how to think through the moral ramifications of those Ten Commandments. You're not allowed to do that. So what does that mean? Oh, it's all hopeless? Better not be. Because the Roman government never allowed the church to include the Ten Commandments in the time of Nero and Diocletian and all the other emperors. But it was taught at home, and there were great Catholic theologians who thought through these issues and understood the implications of each commandment. And so we have to have the same use of our reason. We have to use our minds and our memories, our understanding, and the power of thought to learn as much as we can. Now, does everybody have to have a PhD in theology? No, nor in any other area. But when you do hear challenges against the faith, you do have an obligation to go and find out what the answer might be and study. Catholic Encyclopedia is online. The Fathers of the Church are online. The Bible is online. You can learn Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, and Aramaic online, along with any other language, practically speaking. You can find out the information and look it up and go to the sources, find out, wait a minute, uh, some, some, one of you earlier today had said that you heard that the Catholic Church forbade drinking coffee as a Muslim drink. I, I don't know that that is true or untrue. I suspect it's something more nuanced. So what you do is you look up online, Catholic Church and coffee. But when you, well, you laugh, but you go and you try to find out what was actually said by whom in what context. 
I'd heard for a number of years, while well, the Catholic Church condoned slavery. I looked it up. That wasn't true. As a matter of fact, the opposite was true. It was the Catholic Church that worked toward the ending of slavery at the late Roman Empire. And when the barbarians came in with, and they also had slaves, they worked with the barbarians to end slavery so that by the end of the barbarian invasions around the year 800 or so, the Pope was able to have eradicated slavery in every country in Europe. And it didn't start again until the 1400s. And as soon as it started again, the popes regularly, consistently, repeatedly condemned it under pain of excommunication. They couldn't enforce it. They had no power to. People ignored the condemnation of slavery as much as they present day ignore the condemnation of abortion and birth control. They were just about as obedient to that as they are to birth control and abortion issues. And it was the secular forces who said, well, the Pope has no business talking against slavery. And he's been doing it for a long time. He might as well just be quiet. I've heard people say you shouldn't bother trying to change the law on abortion. Well, the church never stopped condemning slavery and teaching against it until finally the last Christian country that still allowed slavery, which was the empire of Brazil. It was an empire at one point. The empire of Brazil was the last Christian country to have slaves and one of the first to have them. And Pope Leo XIII begged them as a present for his 50th anniversary of ordination that they would eradicate slavery, and they did. And the church had trouble in this country. And again, there were Catholics who said, well, the Pope doesn't really understand America and, you know, that his Pope Gregory the 16th doesn't really understand our institution of slavery and all of that. And he was condemning it and condemning priests and bishops who had slaves because they disobeyed him back then. But eventually it came around and Eventually, that kind of racist slavery mentality was changed. Took a long time. But the church has to be persistent in teaching what's true. And we have to do the same thing even when we hear clergy who say that certain sins are okay. Uh, some clergy have taught, moral theologians have taught, that, well, abortion is okay in some circumstance, birth control is okay. And now we see some of them trying to promote same-sex marriage as okay. And we have to use our minds to understand what the church is teaching, why it teaches it, and learn how to explain that teaching. I try to do my part. I want to present that on EWTN, on radio and TV. I want to do my part, but all of us need to be involved in the same kind of activity in all the areas where we all have expertise. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not an astrophysicist. I'm not a biologist and so many other areas. And when I do make statements that are incorrect, thanks be to God, there are believers out there in those fields who write in and help correct me. I appreciate that. And that must be part of the mentality for all of us. 
because we use reason and God gave us human beings the ability to think and know and reason. He gave that to us. There are times when we are going to make mistakes. We make mistakes with grammar. We make mistakes about our math. We make mistakes about science. Scientists make mistakes about science. They come up with theories they think are going to work and they don't, but then they use their reason to correct their mistakes. And that must be the attitude of all of us, to use our reason when we find that we're using incorrect data, that we correct it, we find out, we learn what the church really did in history, what the commandments really mean, what the sacraments really are about. And in that way, we become the tools of Jesus Christ to evangelize more and more effectively. Our ignorance is something that God can use by filling it up with his knowledge. But it's not the ignorance that's the good. We try to do our best to learn everything we can, and I presume that until the day I either die or become demented, I hope to keep on learning more and more every day. That's my task, but it's also yours. So with the faith that is stronger than the sins inside the church, inside our hearts, and a faith that's stronger than the sins in the world, and with a reason that can learn about the past and understand it, we will re-evangelize this world and re-evangelize inside the church. Sometimes even if it's the clergy, we have to evangelize. It happens. And in that way, when we do die, our blessed Lord will be able to say to us, and we'll hear it in the depths of our being, well done, good, and faithful servant. That's what I want to hear. Hope you do too. All right, we're going to open up to some questions. All right, sir, where are you from? From Orlando, Father. And your question? My question is, our Catholic students from the prominent and best colleges and universities in North America mm -hmm. and the millennials presence in the church are continued to, to reduce in numbers. That's right. From 18 to 39 uh, ages. Mm -hmm. Is there any relativ relativism in that? Are they yeah. related? Uh, you mean any relative or any relevance? Relevance. Relevance. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, good question. So, uh, yes, there's relevance to the fact that so many of our young people are not showing up. There are a variety of reasons. What they are showing up for is that 90 plus percent of them are engaged in looking at pornography weekly. That keeps their fascination. It also keeps them from doing their homework. It's, it's, have, it's truly having an effect. And this is what I mean about the culture to use. This is an image that Scott Hahn uses in his new book on the sacrament of matrimony. Marvelous book, by the way. He'll be talking about it Wednesday on my show. But he talks about how there is radiation, poisonous radiation 
that is permeating our culture and is breaking down the, the, the society the way radiation poisoning breaks down the tissue in a physical body. So that's one factor. And they, they don't often know what the issues are. One of the sad things is, and this is part of being young, but it's also something that by the time they're in college they need, should be dealing with, the meaning of death. This is part of humanity. Again, my cats don't know they're going to die. They have no awareness. They're not, they haven't, at least as far as I know, they haven't signed a will over to me. <laughs> and this, they don't know. We know we're going to die. What does life mean, therefore? What purpose do we have? That's where the religion questions come in as to what is the purpose of life? Where am I headed? And that's missing from a lot of our young people. They don't really fully understand that. So we have to raise important questions and serious questions, questions about responsibility, which means, therefore, they have to make acts of the will and they have to use their intellect. And they also hear fake history about the church. And when they say something that sounds really weird and really bad, check into it. Such a, again, one of the most famous ones I mention all the time, that when, you know, that, that religion is the biggest cause of war. How many of you have heard people say religion is the biggest cause of war in history? Raise your hands. You hear that? That's fake history, totally fake. The number of people who died in wars of Christianity is 2.25 million, about two and a quarter million over 2,000 years. But the number of people who died in wars of atheism in the 20th century alone is 305 million people on the communists, Nazis, and nationalists. So who's more dangerous, the atheist or the religious people? It's the atheist, 150 times as much. That's where you gotta find, and I, by the way, that's from a secular source, University of Hawaii. University of Hawaii dot, um, uh, what is that? I forget what the, uh, EDU. Uh, so it's hawaii.edu, just plain hawaii.edu slash power kills, find the data yourself. But know this stuff and be able to answer. Ma'am, where are you from? Orlando, Florida. Great. And your question? I just want to understand uh, nowadays with all the, the words are being twisted, um, it reminds me of 1984, wars, peace, yep. freedom yep. is, mm -hmm. you know, slavery, etc. Um, I'm understanding, um, people aren't understanding the word Christianity. So when they say, oh, I'm a Christian, everyone says they're a Christian and all that. I just feel like it's almost like if you're breaking the commandment using the, uh, uh, using the Lord's name in vain, because if you're saying you're taking that name Christianity and, and announcing it, you are, and yet you're committing ad uh, adultery or abortions and et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Isn't that using the Lord's name in vain? No, no, that would not be t t taking the Lord's name in vain. It would be adultery, thief, theft, and murder, plus hypocrisy. So it's not taking the Lord's name in vain, it's being a hypocrite while you're calling yourself a Christian and you're breaking God's commandments. So yeah, yeah. No, I don't want to add on that sin to them. Stay with the sins they've actually committed, but just add hypocrisy. Yes, ma'am. My question is not a question as so much as agreeing with you. I was born in 1957. In the 60s, I was still, this is the fashion, and we're going to have a new wave, a new world. Follow it. Something great's coming. 
mini skirts, hot pants. Right. And I think I got into it a little bit because I didn't know any better. And the church didn't right. really explain it to me. And the, then they started to slacken the church. People started coming in all kinds of... You got you to gotta yeah. stay with the microphone, ma'am. Yeah. Then in the church, start, people started to come in with secular clothes. Okay? Then the 70s, it was the cults. And then yep. they brainwash our minds and, tell, right. and told us they, knew they had a better way. Then in the 80s, it was materialism, where yep. they say you have to get everything. Uh, so it was like one after the other after the other. In the 90s, it was like, okay, um, it's the dawn of the um, information age. Now you can, information, uh, the old one is outdated. Now we've got to get the new information. In the 20, at the dawn of the 21st century, it was like globalism. And we've got to get together and unite the world. Right. And now the different spirit now is like nationalism. Yeah. So we are like we're born to be soldiers. And we have to be looking right and left because the religion seems to be a secularism that's changing mm -hmm. every 10 years. Mm -hmm. And most people you meet are secularists. They're not Christians, they say they're Christians, but they're not following the Christian theology. Right. So let, uh, let me respond. Uh, I give you a little way to help because uh, you're exactly right. Um, what we see is they go from one fad to another. And what you're pointing out is that a lot of times the fads contradict each other. And the uh, point that I think G.K. Chesterton put well is that if you marry yourself to the spirit of the age, you will soon find yourself a widow. <laughs> or as one of my favorite country's Western songs says, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. <laughs> again and again and again. That's what the culture wants us to do. That's why I'm saying, have your absolute commitment of faith and use your mind to understand the faith, our history, our doctrine, our practices, our morals, and all the areas of life, so that you have this core by which you judge the society. That's why they hate us. We judge society by the standard of Jesus Christ, and we don't judge Jesus Christ by the standard of the society. And again, that applies to many clergy who go from one fad to another. Whether they do or not, we make that commitment. And that's what we do. Sir, what's your question? Yes, yeah, good to see you, Father. How do you explain the distortion of church history to our brothers and sisters outside when it comes to the Reformation, the Crusades, Inquisition, because it seems like it always leads to an argument and a butting of heads. Mm -hmm. No, so how do we explain that distortion? Here's what we have to do, is learn how to find original sources. Don't be scared by that. You can find original sources. I used to tell my students that I will correct the punctuation in your footnotes. Yeah, that's what they did on the first day of class too. But when they got their first papers back, they stopped laughing because I read footnotes. And I'd like to check out sources and look for what I was saying, for instance, about the uh, history of the church's teaching on slavery. I went and looked up as many of those papal documents as I could find. I found almost all of them. 
There were just a couple. I, there was one from uh, 1425 I couldn't find. But I could find everything else, and in English. So you look it up. And you go, and when people say stuff, it doesn't sound right. Go look it up. And even if you don't find it right away, I guarantee you, as you start looking for the data and you look for the information, you're going to find out a lot more because doing research is not just for finding that one answer. You start to find other things that make more and more sense. And so that's how you approach it. You tell your friends, well, that doesn't sound right. I'm going to look it up. You go look up some of the sources. Catholic Encyclopedia is a good place to start. And the old Catholic Encyclopedia is all online, the whole thing. It's out of, uh, uh, you know, the, the copyright, so the whole thing is there. And they give you footnotes and places to look things up. The Catechism gives you sources. And then you say, here's what it actually said. And if they are open to thought and to knowing facts, they'll listen to you. If they're not, then I've done this to people. Say, well, you're not interested in what's true because it's true, so this conversation is over. And I walk away. Oftentimes they want to keep going. Say, nope, you want to deal with the facts or do you want to just argue nonsense? Want to deal with facts? Let's go. So that's how we have to do it. All right. God bless you all. May the Lord bless you and keep you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.